Here's the Bible's first figure division. I'm going to uh, read it again. And Joseph dreamed yet another dream. In other words, he was in the spirit. And he told it his brethren, and behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee in the earth? So is there any vision in the Bible that isn't figurative? Does anybody know of any? I don't. There are over 80 figurative signposts in Revelation. So when you read the Genesis 37 figurative expression in Revelation 12, who do you suppose it might be? Revelation 12, one, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Obviously Israel, because the Bible has already defined that vision, that uh, figurative language for us. Figurative language appears all over Revelation. Revelation 4, 6, and before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and they had tails like unto scorpions, and there was given to me a reed like unto a rod. Now nowhere in scripture we, do we know how long this rod actually is, so the Lord is giving us a figurative representation, speaking about some spiritual truth. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had horns, two horns, like a lamb. In other words, this beast was likened unto a lamb. Wasn't a real lamb, but he was likened unto one. And he spake as a dragon. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Well, what's the sea? Well, in Revelation 17, 15, we read the sea is kindreds, peoples, tongues, and nations. So we know what the sea is, that the Lord is talking about all those people in the earth. Some figurative language is defined for us by in Revelation itself. Look at Revelation 1, 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels, that's anglos. That's, a, that's important sometimes to understand what these Greek words means. Anglos actually means messenger. It can be any kind of messenger. The Holy Spirit is a messenger. The Lord Jesus is the messenger of the covenant. Satan can be a messenger. Holy angels, we can show in scripture, were messengers. So how do we determine, determine who these messengers are? We have to determine who these messengers are by context by the surrounding verses which give us some clue to who these messengers might be. So the seven stars are the messengers of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks, these candlesticks which thou sawest are seven churches. So if we run into stars later in Revelation, what do we suppose they might represent? They represent messengers. And if we run into candlesticks later in Revelation, what do we suppose they might represent? Churches. Look at Revelation 11, 3 and 4. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. We'll learn, learn later that those days are not actual 24-hour days, but prophetic days. And we'll read that in Ezekiel 4, verses 5 and 6. Clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks that standing before the Lord of the earth. Once we recognize that candlesticks are churches, then we know that Revelation 11, 3, and 4 are telling us about two churches. And then Revelation 17, 18, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So here a woman is likened unto a great city. Other definitions may be found elsewhere in Scripture. And that's kind of an important point. Revelation is in, in great part an index to the rest of Scripture. You have to have a working reference of the rest of the scripture to understand what some of these figures mean. Now here are two principles that we can't avoid. Principle one, interpreting a figurative passage in a, li in a literal way leads to false doctrine. No question. And that's what you see happening all the time. People take some figurative passage that they don't understand and they interpret it literally and it leads to false doctrine. And then the other principle is, principle two, interpreting a literal passage figuratively also leads to false doctrine. And you hear that all the time, too. You'll, pay, you'll, you'll read a verse of scripture to somebody, and they'll say, well, that's figurative. 
You know what, when they interpret a literal passage figuratively, you know what they're really saying? I don't believe that, or I don't want to obey it. That's usually what they're actually saying.